I'm Eric Mack, and I'm joined today by an astrophysicist and a planetary scientist who is at the forefront of the effort to answer one of the biggest mysteries of science. Is there life beyond our planet and beyond our solar system? And now, finally, she has a new tool to help her and other scientists around the world in that quest. It's called the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, and it's set to launch aboard a SpaceX rocket this month. Professor Sarah Seeger of MIT is part of the science leadership team for TESS, and she's here with us now via Skype. Thanks for taking the time to talk with me, Professor. Thanks for having me. So uh, TESS must be an exciting uh, upgrade for you. We've learned so much about exoplanets in recent years, and it's been thanks in large part to the Kepler Space Telescope as well as Hubble and Spitzer and others. Uh, but it's been it's been decades now since those telescopes were conceived, and uh, and now you finally get to work with a tool that is you know designed for this current era of exoplanets. Well, there's always new technology, so yes, it's uh, it's a big deal. Um, you know, and and the most powerful tools and telescopes we have today, they weren't really made for studying exoplanets in the way that TESS was, as I understand it. That's um, right. You know, so, so today yeah. we mainly can talk, yeah, go ahead, talk more about uh, the new capability. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that only Kepler was actually specifically designed for exoplanets. Pretty much everything else, you're right, was just like a general purpose observatory that we got lucky that could work for exoplanets. Well, TESS is like the next step. And surprisingly enough, it's actually not really big. It has four identical cameras, and each camera, the diameter of the aperture, it's only 10 centimeters. So they're like this. And it's amazing to think that just even uh, cameras, they're very specialized, though, at that size, can do the job. But TESS is going to essentially provide the catalog, like the phone book, if you will, of all the best planets for following up, for looking at their atmospheres and studying more about them. TESS is going to be primarily focused on planets that are relatively nearby, though, right? Yeah, planets around stars that are very nearby, although near is also a relative term. Right, right. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, why uh, is is that? Uh, why was that decision made? Is it a technical choice, or why focus? I think it's within, within about three hundred light years, right? Yeah, within about three hundred light years. That's right, because those nearer stars are brighter, and the photons. I always say, like photons are like our currency. Like, if you wanted money, more is always better. And so in astronomy, more photons, more light, it's always better. And to do follow-up measurements of what we find as planets or planet candidates, we want to measure the mass of the planet, we want to look at the atmosphere of the planet, and all of those things require more photons. So that's why the search is for nearby planets. And I gather it's particularly uh, you know, exciting to people like me and of interest to you to be able to um, see more, uh, learn more about the atmosphere in particular, right? That's right. Because that well, gives us a look at something called biosignatures. Yeah, well, eventually biosignatures. But one thing to think about is Venus, sometimes called our sister planet, because Venus is about the same size and same mass as Earth is, actually. What I like to think about was like if there were intelligent aliens building the kind of telescopes we're hoping to build, um, and they can look at our Earth and Venus, they would think it's like they wouldn't really know the difference, actually, unless they can look at the atmosphere. Because our Earth's atmosphere has water vapor and carbon dioxide and other gases, whereas Venus, um, its atmosphere is full of carbon dioxide and its surface is hot enough to melt lead. So we really need the atmosphere to understand like the greenhouse gases and just everything more about the planet to know its temperature and other things. And, and so tell me a little bit about the, the timeline. How long until... Uh, you know, you start to get some data and kind of make sense of what you're getting down from the telescope. Right. Well, the launch is no, it's actually in NASA speak, no earlier than April right. 18th, April 16th. <laughs> That's our first launch window. And once TESS launches, it has what's called a two month of commissioning phase. I always liken a spacecraft, waking it up, like waking up a person from a coma. You know, you don't wake them up and go, hey, go run this Boston Marathon. <laughs> you know, first you'll wake them up and you'll wake your spacecraft up and say, hi, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Put it back to sleep. You know, wake it up, let it kind of move around a little. So checking out the spacecraft and waking up, if you will, each subsystem, that takes a while just to make sure it's all working properly and working it together. I wanna to say something like about 10 days after launch, it might take its first images of the sky, of the night sky, and we'll get some real data that, of, from the cameras. So that will be the first, for me personally, big milestone. But actually it will take tests two months, two whole months to finish this checkout phase. And after two months, the science mission 
of data taking will begin. And, you know, can you tell me uh, what the most exciting thing is for you about this this exploration? You know that you've devoted yourself to, and and uh, how Tess will empower it to go even further. What 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 is most exciting to you about this particular phase of your work? Okay. I think the most exciting thing about Tess is that it really is going to, it really has a chance. And I just want to say chance because we don't know how our luck will pan out, but it really has a chance to find a rocky planet that's the right temperature, the right distance from its star and the right temperature to have life on its surface. And TESS will find a pool of planets like that, that we're going to use a more sophisticated telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, to look at the atmosphere and look for signs of life on it. So to me, TESS represents the very first opportunity to really truly um, make progress in this area of trying to find signs of life on other worlds. TESS itself um, and all space missions, they really have a focus goal. And these so-called Earth-sized planets that TESS is going to find, believe it or not, they're not like our own Earth, actually, because TESS is most sensitive to red stars, red dwarf stars that are like half the size of our sun or even down to 10 or 20 percent the size of our sun. And these planets orbiting these small stars, we're not really sure what they're going to be like, if you want to know the honest truth, because the planets that orbit the small stars, they're very close to the star for the planets that are the right temperature for life, because these small stars have a very low energy output. And what's so interesting is when the planet is that close, tides from the planet, from the star, have affected the planet's um, orbit and its rotation rate. And the, the planet actually orbits one time for every time it orbits. What this means for the planet itself is that one side is permanently bathed in daylight. And one side is permanently night. And the other thing about these small stars is they tend to be very um, active, like they have flares, like giant flares that will create northern lights and send all kinds of, unfortunately, dangerous particles towards these planets. So one of the more exciting things about TESS is being able to explore, like armchair explore with telescopes, these kind of planets that would be so different from our Earth, even if they're about the same size and made of the same material. Yeah, and, you know, we're, we're really kind of heading into a new era of astronomy, it seems, um, where we're going to be able to think about those things a lot more deeply and with data, uh, um, more than we've ever had before. Uh, and te TESS seems to kind of be kicking that off. And then you have the James Webb Space Telescope. The European Space Agency is also going to be launching some planet hunting satellites soon. I mean, care to speculate about what or when we might find it next? <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I can say that two things. One is that we'll have the capability to find signs of life by gases in the atmosphere that don't belong that might be attributed to life. So we'll have the capability to do it. But like nature has to cooperate, right? I mean, there have to be lots of planets that are the right temperature, that have the right ingredients, and life has to not only be there, but generate gases. <laughs> so if nature cooperates, we have a great shot at it. That's one thing. The second thing is, as you just said, not just tests, but these European missions, like the number of um, people going into the field and the kind of number of small but growing amount of resources funneling here will definitely be trying hard. So there will be it won't it, so people try and having the capability. It's just a matter of nature cooperating. I've read that you've made it somewhat of a, a mission of yours to help to find another Earth, which is kind of what you're describing, uh, and within your lifetime. What is it about that goal that appeals to you and drives you? Well, I just always think that there, you know, everyone has their own sort of desire for more. Like on Earth, we go to our job, we do our daily thing. And oftentimes, I just find a lot of people, you know, even children will sometimes say, like, is that it? Uh -huh. And so for me, the Earth kind of represents wanting to know more. Like, how did we form? How did we come to be? How did our Earth form and evolve? Why are we here? Is there anything out there? And for me, just the thought of finding another Earth or Earths will help put all that into context. I don't have a great answer, by the way. I mean, I wish I had like a we have to do this, we're gonna move there next year, we're gonna do something, but it's not. It's just I can't even explain why I'm just so compelled to do it. But part of it is just that hope that there's something bigger out there than we are. Is there anything we're leaving out, anything you wanna add about uh, the, um, the test mission or anything else that you're working on? Yeah, I do, I guess I will add something. So one thing that sometimes um, is really interesting to think about is just how our whole world is going towards big data. I mean, sometimes it's bad, big data analytics, where people are stealing your data to make you know, find patterns. Sometimes it's good big data, like for health or other things. And so TESS actually, and Kepler and 
Kepler and Tess, it's actually just a new version of that. So we actually borrow from and build upon what the rest of the world is doing in artificial intelligence and things like that. So you do think about tests of finding planets, a step towards finding life. But what I just wanted to share is that underlying all that is just the same big data that a lot of other fields are doing in, in computer science and related. Right. It's not just about staying up all night looking through a lens, right? It hasn't been about that for a while. <laughs> it's more like setting your computer on a task and then checking the next day to see what it found. Right. Um, real, real quick, uh, any updates on some of the other projects uh, I know you've been working on, like Starshade? Yeah, okay, I do have something to say. Well, even though TESS is so exciting and it's launching like imminently, it's just the first part in a much longer journey. Because TESS will really nail the problem for these red M dwarf stars. But ultimately, we really need to search sun-like stars, a true sun twin. It's a much harder problem, actually, to find an Earth-sized planet in front of that twin. So I do want to show this to you. I actually can't see myself, but you want to show? Can you see this star shade? What I'm showing you is a star shade. It's actually 1% scale. So the actual star shade as designed would be 100 times bigger than this. And these petals here, they're very sharp and they come to these sharp tips. The star shade would be attached to its own spacecraft, and that spacecraft would be formation flying with the telescope. So the star shade would block out the starlight so the telescope can see the planet directly. And Starshade is a mission under development. You heard like some of these missions like Hubble and the James Webb Space Telescope and Kepler, they can be 30 years from concept to launch. Sure. So the Starshade actually, you know, it was first thought of actually in the 1960s. And it's been revisited every decade because it's nearly impossible to build. But recently, huge amounts of progress are, are being made. So it's in good shape, but it still needs more money. Glad to hear. Well, I, I look forward to the launch. Where are you going to be watching the launch from? Well, I'm going out to Cape Canaveral, and I'm going to be with um, probably a couple thousand people <laughs> who got invited to the launch. I'll be with some of the other test team members. I'm bringing my husband and two kids, and it turned out to be April school break here. So one of them is actually on break. The other one we're pulling out of school. We've invited a bunch of friends, um, and hopefully it'll be a breathtaking experience. Perfect. Well, travel safe and uh, keep up the work, and we will definitely be watching. Thanks a lot, Eric.